Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Last last session, although I know a lot of folks have done a lot of work this afternoon. Uh, before my closing remarks, uh, a couple of announcements. First of all, we want to put out tentative dates for the Aperio on the conference. Uh, dates are in January. See a, a, a venue shortly. We uh, I want to say a couple of words about the Open Conference because if you're involved or so in software development or the implementation of soft software, it's a great way to meet others who are involved in those areas in a you know somewhat more informal context. Um, there'll be space for other collaborations as well. So if you're involved in a project, you think might benefit from some project meeting space. Uh, that's possible, just uh, do get in touch. Anyway, more details when we have them. Some details of next year's events we do have already. Ooh, so, Florida, go get it! We've been working to get the early notice in the conference as far back as a year ahead, and the last week we managed to do it. So. That's a good sign, and I know I am going to see uh, all of you in Florida next year. Uh, so before my closing remarks, uh, we have someone to say a few words about it. Uh, I first met Patty Goetz when I was on the Jersey Board of Directors. Being a glutton for punishment, I was appointed to the Sakai Board of Directors shortly after. And there was much uh, hilarity at one point in a board meeting when the JC board said, you know, what's with these hats then that you have to wear? Now, the next conference I went to, we had a JC board meeting, uh, and Patty had made me a JC embroidered baseball cap. And I offer that as a small example of Patty's thoughtfulness, her attention to detail, and her good humor. And it's been a pleasure knowing Patty in the context of the, the merger and of Jessica before that for, for over 10 years. Patty came out of retirement to shepherd Jessica through the merger process when Jonathan Marker, the former executive director, moved on to, to Duraspace. It was supposed to be a few months out of retirement that turned into, as we know, over two years. So I want to wish Patty uh, a happy retirement again. Uh, we have some, uh, some one or two gifts. Josh, if you want to come up. Patty, if you'd like to come up. But I also do want to begin by saying, uh, there's the hat that I owe you. <laughs> <laughs> We have to say that hat said the Prince of Jason Block. Uh, <laughs> so that's a nice word of place. This is the, I believe, uh, first, maybe it will be the only Aperio uh, bag that's ever been created. And then uh, for my personal thanks, uh, this is locally produced yarn from the Hudson Valley uh, behind yes. the uh, side. So thank you. Guys. And I do make an addition to your point. Thank you. Thank you. resulted in the 1999 JCP. So it's been a long, long journey for me. And uh, I want to thank you for allowing me to be part of this terrific community. And you know I wish it could have been So thank you. Jim Helwig and Alan Regan, the chairs of the Program and Planning Committee, 
Stand up, guys. Anybody who's been on the Planning Committee, the Planning Committee, or the Central Events Committee, stand up, please, and be recognised. Thank you. So I'm not going to take too long, but there are some topics that I, I thought would be appropriate to touch up. It's been a fantastic week. We have had great conversations. We've had two, I think, wonderful keynotes. Uh, even if one of those keynotes did use some material entirely accidentally that I was going to use this morning. So that will reduce the time a little bit. <laughs> so I want to touch around some of the, the key elements of the week for me. The question is why we innovate? Why open? What's the connection between openness and innovation? And something which really we all need to reflect on as we go forward about what kind of organization we're seeking to build, what kind of organization we are. You know, there are no shortage of challenges facing higher education. You work in the space, you work for institutions, you know what they are. I've plucked one or two out that I hear when I travel around the community. I'm sure you will recognize more than one of them. You know, there's this demand to widen participation, to broaden access, get more through the door, often the virtual door. There are issues around retention and support that follow from that increase in numbers, and that's what's made analytics one of the, the hot topics in the last 24 or 36 months. Also see particular pressure from, from many governments uh, around the world to improve research performance. Tying the two together a drive in several parts of the world also to combine that research agenda to drive forward what in the UK we call research informed teaching. You may know by a, a different label. It's very high on the policy agenda in several parts of the world. Almost every institution is touched by the impact of globalization. Marilyn McMillan spoke of NYU's global university strategy in the morning, and that's a particularly coherent and well articulated approach to globalization. For many institutions now offer courses in other parts of the world, or indeed are building campuses in other parts of the world. And that poses particular challenges to, to our community. At the same time, we are expected, of course, to maintain quality. And it goes without saying, we're almost always asked to uh, reduce costs. I want to talk a little bit about some of the responses to those challenges and our role as a community in responding to those challenges. We often are presented with openness as though it's a new thing in higher education. But of course it isn't. Uh, Jonathan Cole, who is a, a sociologist from the Columbia University, and is probably great at American University, said a central pillar of the academic community is its commitment to the free flow of information and ideas. This is not a new thing. It's baked into the DNA of, of higher education. And so we've seen the growth in recent decades of open education. In the 1960s, we saw in the UK the growth of the open university. This was set up to reduce barriers to entry to higher education uh, by qualification. And if one looks in the US and the history of community colleges, actually a very similar initiative in, in many ways. There came over the, last, over the last few decades to be a huge increase in tuition fees. We know about this, we meet it every day. A couple of years ago we had a keynote at a Sakai conference, Andy Kaminatz, who's done a great deal to it. He coined the term generation debt to describe this. And it's done a great deal to popularize what's been called DIY edu or education too. And that's really about lowering financial barriers to entry. And of course, in the last 24 months, we've seen the growth of MOOCs, provisions such as Coursera, edX, Udacity. 
I borrowed a slide from Jack Coleman of, uh, of Adir. You know, there are questions about how open MOOCs are. There are questions about how open their software is, or how effective they are for different categories of learners and appropriateness to different contexts. The jury is out on some of those issues, but the jury is not out on the degree of disruption that they will provide. We face this every day. Second open strand that I want to mention briefly are open educational resources. I mean, there are a confusing number of initiatives in this space that have grown up over the last 13 years. Uh, but it's possible to discern a continuum amongst this. Some OER work really is there to provide a shop window into existing courses. Some move through to actually being the building blocks of open education. In the research world, two very key elements emerged over the last 15 years, really. Uh, open access publication and open data. Really both based around this idea, shocking though it is, that publicly funded research should produce publicly available outputs, either publication or data. Easier to aggregate and locate in the case of data, and easy for others to build on. The next open I wanted to mention is open science. And the somewhat scary thought provided by Michael Nielsen, who's a, a leading physicist, that the closed and disconnected nature of most scientific research is holding back scientific progress in important ways. And coming a little bit closer to home, open source software, which of course we work with, which we're about. Open source software is of course a, a license and an intellectual property rights regime to ensure source code that you can see uh, and work with. We know the arguments in general terms, arguments that open source improves the quality of software, the famous many eyes makes big books like, like uh, improves security because you can understand and enforce and control your organization's security, right through to important benefits like the fact that the ability to internationalize open source software and localize it to fill particular niches that commercial proprietary software will not approach because the market isn't big enough is of major significance uh, globally. A while ago now, in 2005, 2006, Paul Curran, who was then the, the librarian of the University of Michigan, produced a report which looked at why higher education leaders, largely in the US, but not entirely in the US, were increasingly sympathetic to open source software. This really hinged around three principal reasons. There were three principal responses. One was higher education was often presented with poorly repurposed business software. So there was this issue of the suitability of the software that higher ed was being provided with. Uh, we still live in the land of the ERP system that might cost several tens of millions of dollars. Uh, our colleagues in Kuali are doing something about addressing that. And lastly, and perhaps most interestingly, the question of control. Control over higher education's own destiny by higher education itself. I want to unpick that a little because it was represented in both small and large ways. One aspect of control was typically the, the lack of control over the upgrade path of commercial proprietary software. You did not have a chance, uh, a choice about upgrading to the latest version because the old version was not being supported. So there was that element of forced march about it that led to open source software being uh, vastly more attractive to higher ed leaders. There's also an issue around the ability to customize software. And this, I think, is where open source really connects with innovation, because fundamentally open source software is software one can customize. I think it's important to recognize that customization and a sense of ownership connect on many different levels. I didn't think I'd get Brian Eno onto a slide. And 
building on that, Eric von Hippel at MIT has done some interesting work on how innovation is shifting from manufacturer to user. And that, again, connects intimately with the ability to customize open source software, take a product, customize it to the point of innovation. And whilst von Hippel's point is, is made generally uh, across a, a spread of economic activity, it's particularly appropriate in the case of open source software. So we have the open source software as a facilitator of innovation, some might say a, a, a precondition of software innovation. But of course that ability to customize does not come without a cost. Who knows what forking is first of all? The, the ability to take a code base and start independent development on it is a feature of open source software. It's not always a bad thing. It's a bad thing to go into without due consideration and without a conscious decision. In fact, because you can wind up back with homegrown software by doing that and end up there very quickly. And I know of institutions that have done that with some of the software that, that we produce. So it's important to recognize that contribution back is not a nice, warm, fuzzy, glow thing. It's actually a very hard economic thing. If we do not contribute back from our individual institutions, one risk runs the risk of carrying one's customization and innovation forever. The point of a community like ours is by contributing it back, you share that and you share the future maintenance of that adopted by others. So what kind of organization do we need to support the, the culture of contribution and innovation? Well, you know, one of the central metaphors of open source software, you've all come across it, is the cathedral and the bazaar. One model structured in hierarchical teams building software, the traditional software approach, against the apparently more anarchic and chaotic, decentralized open source model a model which has effectively produced thousands of software applications. I actually think this is not just about the software creation process, but it speaks to our, uh, our organizations themselves. I was uh, in Turkey on vacation <coughs> a few years ago, and I came across this news article in an English language Turkish newspaper. If you've ever been in Istanbul's Grand Bazaar when it's raining, you've probably noticed that the roof leaks and there's water running down to the streets. I'm not going to read the section about the plumbing in any more detail. <laughs> it, gets quite, it gets quite worse. But the point is that even the bazaar needs plumbing. Even the bazaar needs infrastructure. Even the bazaar needs some form of governance. And you know, that's that kind of support for projects and communities is the plumbing that a period seeks to provide. But more than that, I'd like to offer an, another architectural uh, metaphor, if I might, for how we think about our organization, and that's the pyramid uh, and the network. Pyramids are what we are used to. We inhabit them a lot of our working lives there's a tendency to interpret any organizational structure as uh, a pyramid. Uh, I'll offer an aside, of course, that the attractiveness of the pyramid as an organizational model increases in direct proportion to one's proximity to the, uh, to the apex. But we are not a pyramid. We are, as Marilyn McMillan pointed out the other morning, a network of peers. We're a, a set of diverse institutions and organizations which come together for specific purposes, who, we, who join in an exploration and the realization of benefits around shared things. No single institution, no single group of institutions is in charge. And I'll offer an anecdote from the period that I became Sakai Executive Director. In fact, I think it happened before I actually took the post. But you will be aware that there was some, uh, shall I say, rivalry between two Sakai projects. Rivalry that I'm sure we've, we've overcome. But in 
2010, when I was appointed, I had groups of people who would sign up to me and say, those folks over there, we haven't got the resources to do this to project business. You have to stop them. And then another group of people would come up from the other side and say exactly the same thing. It's not the kind of organization we are or we should be. I was not about to walk up to one of the major institutions involved in that or any other project and say, you know what, you're wrong, stop doing that. We have to be a facilitator. We are not in charge in that sense. You saw these uh, diagrams uh, a little less luridly in Marilyn's presentation uh, the other morning. Marilyn and I actually didn't talk about this in advance, right? This is not collusion. This is uh, this is serum, this is serum uh, I think we've been reading really the same books now. Um, these diagrams are from uh, the original submission that Paul Barron wrote for the Arpanet, by the way, in I don't know, 1964, I'm not exactly sure. Uh, and Marilyn, of course, merged these diagrams and said, well, you know, NYU is actually in different ways, a combination of the different kinds of networks. And I think when you think about our organization in that way, you see the same thing. I can see elements of the central services, the infrastructure that the foundation seeks to provide, pretty lightweight, pretty basic. We do collectively what individuals individual institutions can't do better themselves. Uh, we have increasingly distributed uh, and decentralized networks around that. Now you may have seen, another way of looking at this, you may have seen board members walking around with t-shirts with this on during the course of the week. Let me, uh, let me explain the crazy t-shirts if I can. This is not a space in uh, Contrary to popular belief, the board is not from Mars. Uh, this is a diagram I drafted for the board to try and illustrate some of the additional dimensions that we talked about in the strategic statement that the board made this week. The color, the red dots here, I represented as board members. The different colors are networks. You can see there the the red, white, and blue in the uh, in your upper left that represents the ears of the consortium. Uh, the role of the board in joining networks, in providing glue and connectivity between the networks that our, are our software communities and software projects and the external networks. So it's not the only thing the board does, but that networking aspect, I think, it will be a critical one going forward. Stephen Johnson had has had a good week uh, in our general sessions, but I did want to point to the role of those diverse networks of people and of openness and stimulating innovation. And I really recommend this, this book to anybody who, who wants to know more about that. It counteracts the idea of innovation being undertaken by the lone inventor in a garret having a, a brainstorm, having a, a wonderful idea, and emphasizes the way that innovation happens amongst diverse groups of people. And of course, it's not the network itself that's smart, it's the fact that we all get smarter because we're connected to it. We had uh, an interesting question in an open board session the other day that I'd like to fall out as I move to a close. Uh, how can we help? Was asked of the board. Well, there are no shortage of ways. I mean, clearly, there are ways to participate and contribute. You can help quality assure your favorite Aperio software. You could write documentation. You could translate something. Participate in the teaching and learning communities of interest or the portfolio community. Start a community of interest around a common theme that you think will attract others. Be a mentor in the new incubation process. You can even contribute code. But help create the culture of contribution that we need to succeed. And that networking idea was not something that is particularly a board responsibility. Just bring that extra dimension to the board. But bring your networks with you. 
into a barrier. Build connections between the, net, the other networks, the professional networks, the other networks that you're all involved in, uh, in one way or another. Help build connections outside our community. That's a pretty vital contribution, uh, in my opinion. And it may even help us join up some of these open dots, which have an unfortunate tendency to operate in a little bit of a silo-like way, in the same way that some of our institutions operate in a, a silo-like way. So, I would like to thank you for your involvement in the community. I'd like to thank you for participating this week. And as we work inside and outside the network that Aperio represents, we'll be able to make that mission uh, a reality. So you get off early and thank you very much.